listen up. And listen up to lift our voice and change. To the living God. To the living God. No one can deny. No one can deny. That Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is. like that video. I live to worship. But how many of us can really say we do that? That we live our life with the full intention of worshiping God with everything that we do. Everything that we do. See, we're getting ready to start a new sermon series. I, we began to talk about it a little bit at the at the uh, New Year's Eve celebration and thank you to everybody that came out. That was by far the best event that we've ever done. The praise team was outstanding. The worship that was in this house and every one of the ministers that did a presentation during that or a sermonette during that uh, worship service was outstanding. We finished the race for 2015. We finished the series on the race. And as we talked about the other night, you know, when you cross the finish line, the thing that you want to do most, of, I know a lot of you remember this from the 5K. When you finally get across that finish line, the thing that you want to do more than anything is celebrate. You get across, and I saw, I saw just about every one of you guys that finished, whether you walked across or ran across, the one thing that you all had in common was this motion. You all were celebrating. You all were praising. You all were worshiping. You all were giving glory to God for, for in my case, for not allowing me to have a heart attack <laughs> and make it through those 3.1 miles. We're moving into a new season in the life of the church. And what is going to usher that season in, what's going to build the ark down the street, what's going to get us that land that we, we ran by, is a spirit of worship. That's what's going to pay the bill on that, on that land. That's what's going to move us out of this sanctuary into the next building, into our own building. That's what's going to get into this community. And, you know, if our, if our goal is to uplift Christ in this community, it all starts with one word, and that word is worship. We've got to get to a place where we're comfortable worshiping. And, and what I want to do is I want to start a brand new sermon series with you this week. It's called Wired for Worship. We're going to go through several weeks where we just talk about worship. Now, if you guys have, we've got a few people, and I want to say thank you to the visitors that are with us today. I'm going to tell you kind of how this thing works out. The first couple of weeks, I'm going to spend some time tackling some theological type things. You know, we're going to talk about specific type, maybe even some scriptures that you haven't wrestled with before in the past. We're going to get deep in some areas where we haven't been. So we'll be in the deep end of the pool. It won't be the place where you'll be diving and splashing and having a good time. We'll be just swimming, staying afloat for the first couple of weeks. So if, you, if you're here for the first time, I ask that you come back. Check out the series. This week, I want to start out with the origin of worship. The origin of worship. Let me tell you something. Every single one of you in here, whether you do it in this sanctuary or not, you were wired for worship. You were built to worship. Now, that's why you've got a favorite team. That's why, that's why when you're at the game and he scores a touchdown, or whether you're at home watching the game, that's why you're yelling at the television. That makes sense, right? Because they cannot hear you, but you're yelling at the top of your voice. I tell you, that's why every other T-shirt you have is the team. Because you're built to worship. That, that's why you fall in love. That's why some of us have cried more tears for people that have hurt us than God. Because we are built to worship. That's why you love your family so much. That's why you love your children so much. That's why you love your community so much. And let me tell you something. God doesn't have a problem with you worshiping anything, right? He says, have no other gods above me. They don't have a problem with you adoring somebody or falling in love with somebody or, or even Loving your job or your community or your football team. God didn't have a problem with you loving things. He put a spirit of love in you. But the problem comes in is when you're building, you're wired to worship, and you begin to worship things higher than God. You take that special person and you put them up higher than God. 
You take that child, you take that job, you take that car, you take that house, you take that parent, you take that grandparent, you take whatever it is, you fill in the blank, whatever is that thing that you brought into the prayer, whatever it is that you put up, you take that thing and you put it on high. I'm Greek. I'm Q. There was a number of years when I took that, that, that thing and I put it on high. And the way you can tell what you worship is just follow your checkbook. Follow your checkbook. It will lead you to the way of what you worship. I, I'm just being honest with you. Follow your schedule. Because it's on your schedule. It's taking up the majority of your time. There are huge blocks of time within your schedule. And you can't get to other things. Because of these things that you put on top. And sometimes, see, this is, this is a challenge, right? Sometimes if we're honest, if we're really honest with ourselves, that is the thing that's blocking us from getting in that closer relationship with God. So God, he built you to worship. He built you to love. He built you to adore. But he also built you to worship, love, and adore him. He's got to be first. And let me tell you something. When you take that mate, or that car, or that child, or that house, or that job, or that money, and you put it up above God, two things will happen. First of all, you threaten to lose that thing. Threaten to lose that thing. But the second thing that will happen is that very thing that you put up will be the thing to come back and hurt you. So in order for us to understand worship, in order for us to understand worship, we need to go back to the origin of worship. Anytime that we are researching anything, you should always start with its origin in the Bible. If you can't find its origin in the Bible, start with the first time that Jesus encountered it. But, but I want to start with the origin of worship today. So first of all, in order for us to understand this, there are three named angels in the Bible. There is Michael. He's the angel of prayer. There is Gabriel. He's the angel of the word. Think about Michael. Michael is the one that comes to Daniel and said, hey, I heard your prayer, but in my route to come to you, I got into a little bit of a conflict on the way, and I, I was coming. We see Gabriel. Gabriel is the one that comes to uh, uh, Mary and says, hey, you're pregnant, and guess what? It's God's. So Gabriel brings the word, and then there's this third angel that's mentioned in the Bible, and his name is Lucifer. And Lucifer is the angel of worship. How many of you guys knew that? Let's get into the scripture. We'll, we'll go back one time. First of all, let me just tell you something real quick. For those of you who are trying to figure out how to get closer to God, here is, here is the solution. If you think about what we do in a service, we have prayer, we have the word, which I'm giving now, and then we have worship. Every service that you go to, prayer, word, worship. And if you would just take five minutes of your time and dedicate it to these words. See, I'm giving you out these words every week. If you take this word and spend five minutes in it, Google it, look it up, look up the verse, find the commentary, get into it for five minutes. And then you spend five minutes of praying, asking God, okay, God, what will you have me do with this? What, what, what does this mean to me? Help me to see myself in it. I'm praying for your children throughout it. Praying for your house. Praying for your mate throughout it. And then take another five minutes of doing nothing but worshiping God. You'll be close. Now, now, now check this out, married folks. If you and your mate would do what I just said together, what would that do for your marriage? Children, people with children. If you and your mate or you and your children sat down and did this with these verses once a week, 15 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, 15, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. What would that do for your children going off to school in the morning time or before they go to bed at night? But what we see here is the first worshiper, and we see him in, verse, in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel uh, chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 14, it says, <coughs> verse 11, it says, your pomp, your splendor is brought down, Sheol, 
and the sound of your string instruments. And so, you know, we talk about him being a worship leader. You know, Lucifer is actually thought to have had a harp as part of his being. So, so I know sometimes we see the images of the, the wings and somebody playing the strings. This is where this stuff comes from. But, but the actual thought is that Lucifer actually had within his being a stringed instrument. It says, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. And Lucifer by itself means light. He was, the, he was considered to be the morning star. He was the head of the choir. He was what Quentin is to us. He was the worship leader. He says, you son of the morning. Let's look over in Ezekiel real quick. Ezekiel says, more, in verse, uh, 28, chapter 28, verse 11 says, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, take up lamentation for the king of Tyre. And let me explain something to you. It says the king of Tyre, and I'm going to prove this to you in just a second. He's not talking about the king of Tyre here. He's talking about Lucifer. And see, there are instances in the Bible where even Jesus would be talking to Peter, and he'd say, get behind me, Satan. He's not calling Peter Satan, but he's speaking directly to the spirit that's leading Peter to do the wrong thing. And what he's doing right here is he's speaking to that spirit that's, that's causing this king to hurt the uh, children of Israel. And he's saying to Lucifer, he's saying, and say to him, thus says the Lord, you are the seal of perfection. You are full of wisdom and, and you are perfect in beauty. They say, they say that this Lucifer angel was the most beautiful of all the angels. He was, he was, he was the worship leader. It says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. So Tyree couldn't have been, the king of Tyree couldn't have been in the garden of God in Eden way back then. He's saying that every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, diamond, Beryl, onts, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. See, now, not only did he have this ability to play the strings, not only was he beautiful, but he had on the nicest clothes possible. He had every single stone that was precious and known to God on his clothes. He says the workmanship of your timbrels and your pipes. See, see, he also had the ability to make sounds like horns. So he had to string the percussion and the horn. All this was inside of him. He was a walking man. Have you ever seen that guy at the circus that has the, 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 the bass drum out front and the, the playing the gazoo and got, got a horn on his foot? That's what Satan was, but on a whole other level. He said he was prepared for you on the day you were created. He was created on that day with everything that he needed to be the best worshiper in the world. He could celebrate God. He could get everybody else going. He could, he could walk up in this place right now and start playing whatever that is inside of him, his horns and, and his percussions. He wouldn't need a piano. He wouldn't need Quentin. He wouldn't need Keish. He wouldn't need anybody. It would just be him. And he could take us to places that we could never go in worship of God. He said, you were the anointed cherub. He said, I told you he was an angel. You were the anointed angel. You were the one, not, not the other two, you were the anointed angel. You had everything that you needed. Let me tell you something, parents. Music is a dangerous thing. You better be careful with what you let your children listen to because the same power that's, that Lucifer had back then with music, the anointment that he had back then with music, it's the same thing these guys that are selling out these millions of albums. Have you listened to that junk? Have you paid attention to that junk? I was in here playing around the other day and, and I did Cam Newton and did the dab then I went and looked the lyrics up. Do you realize what the mass and the uh, the professionals in our industry and, and all the preachers and, 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 and all the coaches are doing when they're supporting that dab. You know what that song is about? Go look into the words of some of the things that, that's happening and some of the uh, lyrics. That's, that song's all about weed. Just so you know. 
And everybody from the president down is dabbed. And Lucifer is accomplishing his mission because the anointing on music is so strong that you just act without even thinking, why am I doing why am I doing this? He said, you were, you were the anointed cherub who covers. You, you were the one who got everything ready. You know how Quentin kind of got the worship ready so I could just kind of walk in here with the word? You were the anointed cherub that covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were there. You were in heaven. What we learn is from the origins of worship, the first worshiper was Lucifer. He was the third angel that's mentioned in the Bible. He had everything that he needed to worship. He had everything that any of us would ever want in order to praise God with. Now let's look at the, the importance of worship. I want to look at, keep going in Ezekiel just a little bit further. Uh, look at verse 15. It says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. You were perfect. God created this. You know, we always talk about God. He doesn't create anything else perfect. You know, we always talk about that. He was created perfect. That's why perfection sometimes is, is a goal that gets us in trouble. Because trying to be perfect at some things is what's pulled us further and further away from God. Trying to be the best at something, nothing wrong with being the best. Not unless it takes you away from God. He says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in your heart. The day that you realized you were perfect, that's what happened to most of us, right? The day that you realized that you were all that, that was the day that everything went downhill for you today. The day that you started thinking that you was the best husband, that was the day that things started going wrong in your marriage. The day that you felt like you could handle temptation, that was the day that you failed the temptation. The day that you realized that you were perfect was the day that if you could go back to a point in your life and find it, that was pride and, 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 and some other stuff that when you, when you thought you did something great and you, you didn't need any more help, and from that point forward, things got a little bit off course for you. Grandma would say, you thought you were bad enough. Y'all remember that? You thought you were big and bad enough to go out there and get it. How'd that work out for you? Verse 16 says, by the abundance of your trading, See, see, what he started to do was he was called to worship. He was called to be a worshiper. He was called to put God first. But he began to do what? He began to trade. He's, God is beautiful. But I'm perfect. I want to put a little bit more effort into my music. I want to put a little bit more effort into growing my following. I want to put a little bit more effort into obtaining a little bit more of this kingdom. He's wonderful, but so am I. Start to trade, and, and if we're not careful, we start to trade. We start to say, hey, I want to grow myself in this area. I want to take my family to this place. I want to take my wife or my husband or, or my children, or I want to go this place in my job, and we begin to move away from God. We begin to trade a heavenly father for stuff on earth that will go back to the dust. Begin to say, well, you know, I've been there two Saturdays this month. I've been there. We begin to say, well, I got, I got some other things to do. I need to get these things right first. I need to be a more responsible, you know, man in my house. I need to do these things. And we start to put all these types of, of human characteristics above God. And it's happened to everybody in this room. Not only have you done it, but somebody did it around you. And because of it, you were hurt by it. You didn't get enough time with that person. You didn't get enough time with, with those people. You were shunned because of it. Because if they put this thing above God, 
Yeah, who are you? He says, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence. You know how we get, when, when we get greedy with money and, and we lose that money? You know how we get when we fall in love, get smitten with somebody and they don't, they don't want us? And What is that called? Domestic what? Violence it happens. And you know what it's like when we, when we want our way at work and we can't get our way at work? And so we become backbiting and ditch digging. You know all those old terms from the old church. See, when you start to trade and you start putting things higher to God, then you come out of his power and now you're operating in, in this realm of power. And listen, the weapons in this realm are the opposite of the weapons that are with God. You start to doing stuff like lying and cheating and manipulating versus praising and praying. And in the end, you don't have anything. You look behind you and it's just a bunch of hurt people. But you were a provider and you were and, and you were there and you 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 do you did this and you did that and you were at work and you were the first day and the last to leave. But when it's time to be laid off, you may be the first out. It says, not only did he did he get filled with violence, but the violence caused him to sin. Therefore, I cash. You as profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you. That's what happens. When we, we put things above God, listen, let me tell you something. I don't have to counsel with another you know, uh, family. I don't have to counsel with another young man. I don't have to counsel with another old man to realize, or old woman, I'm, I'm saying old woman or child, to realize the danger of putting anything, anything above God. I don't have to see another sad story. I don't have to watch another one of these guys, another Justin Bieber, another Michael Jackson, another Whitney Houston. I don't have to watch another person, be another Bill Cosby, be pushed out in front of us to mourn because, because they put something above God. I don't want to see another family broken. I don't want to see another child turn to drugs. I don't want to see another child turn to a life of, of homosexuality because they put something above God or because they saw somebody putting something above God it says oh covering cherub you, he was that third angel that I was telling you about you believe me now don't you? he said oh covering cherub from the mist of the fire and stones he kicked them out see that's the risk that's the risk that's the risk, guys. That's the risk. That's what's happening when we are not making decisions that show us lifting Christ up. And listen, we are uplift Christian ministries. Our mission is to what? Lift up Christ. Verse 17 says, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And what he's saying is, because you were so arrogant, because you thought you were so great, you turned away from God. It was your beauty. It was your, it was your skill. It was your smarts. It was, it, was your, it, was your, it was your home. It was that car. It was, it was that beautiful marriage that you have. It was those beautiful kids that you have. And once you realized they were beautiful, you started putting so much more effort, worldly effort into it. You took God out of it. And it's because you lift, your heart was lifted up because you were prideful. He, said, he, says, he says, you corrupted your wisdom. You started to think. You started to make up new rules. You started to say things that were not in the Bible. You started to, to put your wife in this place and you took a little scripture that they talked about marriage and then you made her the, the head of your life or him the head of your life or a child the head. You took a little scripture about raise up a child and now you put that child above God. You corrupted the wisdom. You flipped it around to, to meet your greed. To meet your emotions so that you could feel good. He says, for, for the sake of your own splendor. He says, and for that, I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. And ultimately what happens is, 
and you fall, when you put God below anything in your life, ultimately, at some point, you fall and you fall in front of everybody. And your legacy, your legacy, your legacy is ruined. That's what happened to Satan. Verse 18 says, you defiled your sanctuary. You, you changed your house. You changed the way you do things. You changed the way you attended church. You changed the, the, the things that you put around church by the multitude of your iniquities. See, you started making mistakes one after another, one after another, one after another. Because when you remove yourself from God and you're not close to him, you can't help but make mistakes. It says by the iniquity of your trading, he went back. That's important. Anytime it's mentioned twice, it's important. You're trading something. You, you're trading whatever it is that you're trading for God. Whatever it is that you brought in here, that you thought about on the way here, the thing that's on schedule for all next week, whatever that thing is that you're trading for God, I don't care how great it is, eventually it's going to get you. He says, therefore, I brought fire from the mist, I devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All, all your frat brothers, they'll just be sitting around talking about you like they talked about the last guy. All of your homeboys, homegirls, all of the women who were telling you, don't put up with that mess, they'll be just waiting on you to fall. And that's how it works. Let me tell you something. The key barrier to worship in God is anything we put above God. The reason why you're just not free to worship is because in many cases you're thinking about what other people are going to think if you get up and worship. Like I told you on Thursday night, you have everything, everything that Lucifer had. God gave you string instrument in your vocal cords. God gave you horns within your lungs. God gave you percussions. There's no reason why you shouldn't be worshiping God more. Every single one of us, me included, there's absolutely no reason why we should not be worshiping God more than what we're worshiping God. Amen. And I believe the primary reason is that pride. We're more worried about what the person sitting beside us or the person across the street from us or the person in the house with us, what my, what my mate will think, what my kids will think. We're more worried about our reputation than we are about praising God. And God tells us right there in Isaiah that if we would just praise him, that he'd take away all of our past and that he'd give us this new future and that he'd open all these doors, he'll take us out the wilderness, Isaiah 43. That he'll, he'll come in where our deserts are and he'll give us the things that we lack. But yet still praise is still hard for you, isn't it? Worship is still hard, unless you're at the football game. So I looked up this word worship in the Hebrew. And I was surprised at what I found. This is the word for worship in the Hebrew. It's pro, and I am by no way a Hebrew scholar. I have my, my own struggles with English. But the word here is proskuneo. Proskuneo. And as I began to look up this, this word in the Hebrew, I wanted to understand the origins of this word, where it came from. What I found out is the craziest thing. This word doesn't mean worship. But worship was the closest word that man could put to it to make it make sense. The word that we use as worship throughout the entire Bible is this word, proskoneo. Do you know what it means? 
It means to kiss. To kiss, that's what it means. It wouldn't make sense inside, the, inside of your Bible, right? Kiss him, yeah, it wouldn't make sense. Then I went a level deeper to understand what exactly it meant by kiss, because that made immediate sense to me. But as I began to look at it to understand why they wouldn't use kiss, it would be just fine to use kiss instead of worship. If we had all saw kiss all our life, we'd be perfectly okay with it. But it doesn't just mean kiss. It means to lick the master's hand like a dog licks the master's hand. Could you imagine you, you're the scholar that gets this Hebrew text and they say, okay, translate this thing into where we can read it in all languages and English and everything. And, and you get to this word and he's okay, now tell me what does this word mean? And they say it means to, to lick, lick the hand like a dog licks the master's hand. They came up with a good word, worship, right? But I began to think about that. I began to think about a time in my life when we first moved to Charlotte. We bought a dog. And every night, no matter what time I came home, no matter how late it was, my two children and that dog would meet me at the door and I couldn't even get into the house. Angelo was smaller, Sloan was smaller. Angelo would be on one side of me and Sloan would be around my neck. And Bella would be on my leg. She wasn't always being good. And listen to me. Those were the best times of my life. Having small kids, let me talk to people with small kids, love on them. They get big and you still love on them then, but they get too heavy to pick up. <laughs> and they get busy, they get to doing their homework, and they can't always meet you at the door. But let me tell you something. Even to this day, when the kids don't come, that dog stops what it's doing. <laughs> it meets me at the door. I don't care, it can be eating, it'll stop eating. It can be sleeping, it'll stop sleeping. It can be playing with the other kids. It'll stop doing what, he, what she's doing. And she'll be at that door, she's wagging her tail, and she can't wait to lick me. That's good. And that's what God wants from us. You see, see, my dog is smart in that he understands that while, I, while you know, he's got food to eat, one day that food could run out. So he wants to worship the master that brings him that food and water versus the food and water that he received. That's good. That's good. See, he knows when he's out playing with the family and everything that that's all great. But when the master comes home, he leaves the family to worship the one that put the family together. He know how great it is to have a roof overhead and to be sleep, you know, and, and laid out. But he breaks away from that to come to worship the master that put the roof over his head. Now, how crazy would a dog be that could be out there in the woods, in the wilderness, fending for themselves, trying to feed themselves, trying to find shelter, trying to find companionship? How crazy would that dog be to bite the hand that feeds him? To not take time out away from the things that it's been blessed with. To spend it with the master. And we're all smarter than dogs. And what we've got to do, guys, inside of every aspect in your life. You, if, if, go to the Bible, prove me wrong. If there's anything in the Bible that God gives you the permission to put above God, show it to me. If there's any rational thing in the Bible that you can find, I'm not talking about going through six or seven different books and old and new and trying to tie something together. But if you can find something that makes sense, that shows that you're supposed to be doing something other than praising God with all the fiber in your life, show it to me. I'll, pre I'll get up here in a minute. 
But I'm convinced that God is looking for some worshipers. Some people who are willing to lick his hand, to, to be that, that, that dog. And, and check this out. This is the crazy thing about that dog situation. Sometimes when I get home, I'm so tired. I don't want to see Bella. But we serve a God that's never too tired for you. He's always willing and able to help you through any situation. I don't care how many times you've been on your knees, how much you've prayed, how much you've asked, how many mistakes you've made. He is always willing to be there for you. Listen, sometimes Bella is so stinky and so dirty. I don't want to put my hands on her. But we serve a God that no matter how dirty you've been, how, how wrong you've been, what kind of mistakes you've made, he is willing and able to not just put his hands on you. The psalmist says he wants to put you underneath his wings. He wants to bring you in close. He wants to inhale your smell. He allowed his son to die to clean you up. No matter what smell you have, what stench you have, no matter what mistake you've made, you've got a father that is already taking care of it. I got a question for you. How many of you choose to worship? How many of you choose to put God first? Let me tell you something. If you put God first, he will not let you down. Let me tell you something. If you try what I'm telling you now, he will not let you down. Try this in your marriage. He won't let you down. The thing that you've been trying in your marriage, it has not been working. Try this. Try this with your children. He will not let you down. The thing that you've been trying, the thing that they tried with you and the thing that they tried with them, didn't work all the time. But everybody who was raised in God's house, well, they're doing just fine. Try this in your job, you know. Put God first over everything. Understand that he's the provider, that he's the protector, that he is the one that you commune with. There's no loneliness when, when you're close and have a relationship with God. No matter what you're going through. Let me tell you something. Bella got sick. I couldn't fix it. We took it to the vet. They said it was going to be like $500. I asked them how much it cost to lay, lay her down. My wife said, we're not going to lay her down. <laughs> but you serve a God that will invest in you unlimited amount of resources that will put your marriage back together. If there's healing that is needed, he's got all the healing. He's the only one that can do healing. This stuff that doctors do, they can't do anything. Ask Steve Jobs. If a billion dollars couldn't buy life, what are you going to buy? There's only one person that heals. There's only one person that can make whole. So we might as well put him up. We may as well worship him. This week I want you to think about this statement. And it's a very simple, uh, probably the most simplest statement that I've ever said. And the reason why it's so simple is because it's so true. Listen, this week I want you to get to this place in your life. I don't care what you've got going on. I don't care what it costs you. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care what you were taught, what you read in a book. I don't care what you've been through. You know, some of this stuff that we're doing, we're doing it because we went through a certain thing growing up or we saw something growing up and now we don't want that same thing. And so we're going to try and do this thing. And the only thing that can fix anything, the only thing that can do anything is God. You don't have control over the situation. It looks like it and it feels like it, but you don't have control. And it's just a matter of time before you realize that. What I want you to do this week, I don't care where you are in your life, where you are in your marriage, where you are with your children, where you are with, with, with your job. I don't care what's going on. I want you to do one thing this week. I want you to choose to worship God with all of your heart. 
I want you anything that you have up above God. I want you to bring it down and put God above it and trust God. Trust God for it. To God be the glory.